So I'd like to uh, share something uh, that kind of came out of some discussions that we had uh, with lots of folks at supercomputing last year um, and have been ruminating on. And these are just kind of my reflections and explorations, um, not really something that uh, I'm uh, indicating what NVIDIA specifically endorses. So uh, if you want to oversimplify things, one of the ways, uh, things we've been talking about in this community for a long time uh, from the beginning of the HPC Containers Advisory Council was sort of what's the difference between HPC and enterprise? So one of the ways that you could look at this is that the, uh, I'm using very uh, CEO math here, uh, the ratio of users to developers is approximately one to one in HPC, and it's approximately a thousand to one uh, in the enterprise. Um, in HPC, we want total control. We really care about how everything is managed and so on. So we're using Slurm and so on for that. Uh, whereas in the enterprise, you know, there's approximately none, and Kubernetes is just fine with that. Um, the need for admins in the first case is pretty intensive. I need these special components installed. Uh, this is, uh, I'm doing my own development. I'm the only person around here who needs this particular package or whatever. Or I need very specific network policies that nobody else has. And uh, I want to do something special. I'm a slow snowflake. Um, whereas an enterprise, you don't get to do that. Um, and uh, in the first place, you're trying to sort of develop new science, create things that weren't previously possible, and it's sort of experts who are in control and wanting to uh, have their hands on the knobs and levers. Uh, whereas in the enterprise, you're basically just looking for a big red easy button. Like, I want to run this, uh, like, you know, molecular dynamics code or uh, inference job or whatever it is. So I'd like to suggest, I'd like to uh, engage in defensive strategy. So <clears throat> as we look forward as a community, what, where's the key pain point that we're expected to see? I'd like to suggest that it's admins. Uh, it's not resources, uh, it's not lots of other things, but it's admins. And particularly the HPC community is seeing this flight <laughs> of uh, there are so many new data centers uh, for, H for AI and so on that they're getting hired away, and so you can't keep them. Um, so, uh, and if you go buy a system that might last seven years or whatever, uh, whatever infrastructure you have just isn't going to last. You need somebody to keep up with, uh, you know, if you look at all the innovation that we in this community has been done by people in this room have happened over the last several years, that's a lot to keep up with. And it's almost impossible for any given institution to have all of that expertise in house to be able to do that. And so, um, uh, the implications of that is that the number of these high-touch applications are going to be limited by the admin availability. And so you're just not going to be able to get that many applications to the point where they can become easy buttons. And uh, any apps that sort of uh, don't fit into a couple categories are going to uh, get squeezed out. So let's look at that a little bit more. So uh, I'd like to suggest that we're sort of more now in the top row and we're becoming uh, more simplified. So this may or may not be true, but like I'm just putting this out for discussion. So if you look at what happens in the typical HPC data center, there are some people that get all the love. They get all the resources, they get all the admins, um, and they're, uh, you know, it's the mission critical stuff that we've got to make that work. And so they get everything they need. Um, there's some that uh, have, are sort of all ready in package and ready to go that are more of fit the cloud model um, where the cloud has the infrastructure and you can just do the kind of easy button thing. And then there's this middle bucket. And the middle bucket are those of us that want to innovate. We want to do special things. We want control and we want the power to be able to do it. But in order to do many of those things, we need help. We need admin help. And there are not enough admins. <clears throat> so. Uh, what do you do in that space? Um, if you, one of the things that you might do is to say, darn it, I can't get that done in my data center, but those cloud people over there are actually adding more infrastructure for HPC people like me, and so they may make it possible for me to do it. And so if I have enough money not to hire admins, I may go use the cloud instead of my uh, something in my HP data center. And all the admins and the people there are likely to put the squeeze on that and say, you know, like, you know, they're, sorry, we can't help you. There's not enough of us to go around. And so uh, the key thing to this I'd like to suggest is this box at the bottom, which is basically the substrate 
of uh, that we can build on top of to make more things possible. So what is that? Uh, uh, so we'll get to that in a moment. Um, I informally talked to a bunch of different people and kind of get some got some perspectives. Um, uh, these are just my interpretations, not quotes. Um, some people are like, uh, yeah, that's our job in our data center to go do new science, and we're not going to have very many applications, and we have all the admins we need to be able to do that. And, you know, we have new admins, and uh, we're growing them up and sort of uh, sending them off into the wild, and hopefully we keep enough of them, right? So um, Simon at uh, U Bristol and uh, Thomas Schultes would say this. Um, others are willing to go out and look at using the web. Uh, it's, it's what Arjun at uh, ORNL would say. Um, and there's sort of this, you know, lots of mixes in between. So what are some observations and trends here? So uh, one is that um, in the HPC enterprise space, um, like and HPC has continued to grow over time. That's really cool. There's this other little brother called AI that's like shot up like crazy. And a lot of the resources and attention and so on are going to that. So what do we do? In HPC, do we get the same kind of uh, control and influence that we had 10 or 20 years ago? I'd like to suggest we don't. And we have to deal with that reality. We can't complain about it. Complaining about it isn't going to make it any better or different. So how is it that uh, we can find our way forward? I'd like to suggest that it's by looking at how we can learn, share resources, and share infrastructure. Um, so what's in that infrastructure? Again, that infrastructure in any HPC is going to need to grow and change over its lifetime. And data centers can't afford to keep up with that with their own. And so, and it's also the case that the rate of standing up new data centers, uh, if you look at the number of data centers that would be in the, the top 50 uh, that have gone up just this year, you know, it used to be like one or two a year, and now it's like, you know, uh, definitely, you know, many, many uh, that are happening, and it's crazy. So we just can't sustain that without something else. So we have to reduce the cost and the effort and complexity. So this customization by HPC experts is feeling the squeeze. What do we need? We need automation, and we need to um, uh, make more investment in uh, capital expenditures in order to reduce the OPEX, uh, the operational expenditures. And uh, some things we could do that are at smarter networks and DPUs. I'll uh, talk a bit about that. So one of the things that I've heard people talk about is sort of the tiering in admin support. So you may have a relatively small number of the old timers, uh, people with greater expertise. They're the ones that will figure out, is it OK to do such and such? And they'll have you know, relatively new hires that are their staff that don't have the experience. Um, and they'll say, like, it's OK, uh, Sally, for you to do this thing. And this thing is pretty automated. You don't have to learn a lot about how to do it because the automation is placed for being able to do that. And so, uh, and it's sort of an automation or bust. If you can't find something that you can hand off to somebody that's that simple, you won't get it. You just won't. And so uh, we need more of that kind of automation infrastructure for provisioning, uh, for things like network isolation by default, um, and so that that can become increasingly a uh, push button. But if you've done more automation for that, then uh, you can essentially just say, yeah, I want to do this thing. And instead of doing it for the whole cluster, I could do it to an arbitrarily fine granularity um, so that you can get enforcement of uh, security groups and other things that are very fine grain control all the way down to the process level. So it points to uh, an architecture that might look something like this, where you have a line, and above that, you have all the stuff that we're doing in Kubernetes and Slurm and uh, innovation and so on. And that's built on top of some substrate. And that's a trusted infrastructure. Um, so a challenge for us is to sort of, what's the min cut line between those two? What are the fundamental primitives that we need? How do we make that be small in number as possible? Um, so that we can then support it. And then how do we make that so that it works in a lot of different places? Maybe it can't work everywhere, but um, increase, make it increasingly available to run there. So uh, we just can't afford to spend uh, so much on professional services, and we want to enable more people. So um, we can do this innovation up at the Kubernetes and Slurm level. Maybe it's per site. Maybe it's in some open source efforts. Maybe there's some commercial offerings in that space. Um, and uh, kind of work on what's below this interface. So this thing might be able to be proprietary. I've talked to a number of people of like, would you trust it if somebody else did this to you? And they say, you know, if I can even have that be a cloud-managed service for me, 
um, uh, as long as my data and uh, uh, all my names of my containers and so on are separated from everybody else. Um, and this lowest level thing uh, would deal with the provisioning of images, firmware, et cetera. It had the trusted enforcement of security, deal with multi-tenant network and storage um, and the TPM and so on. Uh, had to include uh, the cert uh, services, um, maybe something like uh, DPU secure storage. Um, and operate on all the policies that the data center admin and that the tenant admin uh, would do on top of that. Um, and so, uh, and that underlying tech needs to be able to expose whatever goodness is in the hardware there, for example, the confidential computing or DPUs. So you can start to look at something like this, where um, uh, you have uh, something, uh, the, the applications, and then you want to, oh, that didn't do nice things in this version. Sorry about that. Um, so I, I checked it before I uh, converted to it. So um, uh, their AWS uh, Crossplane and Terraform are examples of uh, being able to make it so that you can work on a variety of different clouds. Um, and there are different kinds of end-to-end uh, -end Kubernetes provisioning. Each of the different uh, CSPs sort of has their own. And there's infrastructure provisioning uh, and then hardware uh, inventory. So there's uh, a new effort uh, called Open Chami, um, an open composable heterogeneous adaptable management infrastructure. That's why they call it Open Chami and not all that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's sort of like this uh, cloud-like uh, hardware provisioner and inventory manager um, that's focused on security and dealing with secure boot and TPM and cert management and firmware management, et cetera, and sort of leverages the cloud and it for being able to get images. Um, it's an extension of the Cray ES system, uh, similar to CSM, but it's an open source effort. Uh, much of that has been redone. Uh, and there's good representation of the room here with CSCS, uh, HPE, LANL, uh, NERSC, and UBristol uh, are all part of this effort. Um, so, you know, they're still trying to figure out how to deal with uh, federation and multi-tenancy and sort of testing and uh, admin tooling. Um, and there's sort of this gap of sort of having a SPAC for system images of like, how do we standardize on this? So I think there's a fair bit of work there. So. Um, Moving towards wrapping up here, I think one of the things that can help this uh, is again this trade off between CapEx and OpEx. Like, if I just don't have the people, how do I make it easier? How do I make it less complicated? How do I give myself a richer set of primitives? So, one of the things that can be helpful is to have customization down for every node so that you don't have to worry about and saying, like, everything under this switch has to be used this standard vanilla set of network policies or whatever, that that can be specialized all the way down to the node. And you can do that by having some trusted infrastructure like a data processing unit, a DPU, at each node. Um, so that that kind of thing can enable you to bring your own IP or to have. Uh, a policy where you can either have access to the internet or to corpnet, but not both at the same time, so you're not exfiltrating data. Um, that you can have hardware enforcement of security groups. It's not something that's there, but uh, that's something that could be done. Um, and you can make that all ephemeral per job, so that every time you uh, deploy a job to a node, uh, you can update that, and when you take the job or the uh, the tenant away that you can sort of undo that. You get isolation, then you're protecting the network switch and the rest of the data center from that node. It's kind of a sheep's gate that keeps bad stuff from getting out. Um, it also lets you do concurrent finer grain uh, updates. So every node can proceed in parallel with whatever it's doing uh, versus having to sequentialize those at the switch. And you keep a smaller blast radius in case of some mistake or an attack. <laughs> Um, and you get more autonomy and acceleration with this. So uh, the DPU, as part of the trusted infrastructure, uh, has its own control for the BMC, uh, its own Redfish link. Uh, it's separate, uh, separately controlled from the compute node. So if you hack the compute node, you can't hack that. Um, it also lets you uh, deal with credentials like for authorization um, and authentication can happen on the DPU instead of having to share those creds uh, with a compute node that uh, could get hacked and leaked and share those with somebody else. Um, and you can do things like shift the storage from the untrusted compute node in. So just to, uh, I think there, uh, I'd like to raise more questions here of um, uh, whether we think that an increasing fraction of these applications are going to become more easy button, 
um, how we could define the right low level infrastructure to provide building blocks. Um, how we can make it extensible, um, what kinds of plugins we need for that trusted infrastructure uh, to be able to be under admin control. Um, and to ask a question of like, can we, for all the innovation that we want to do, can that sort of be above the line and keep it up there so that we can uh, share this low level infrastructure and have that be relatively stable and secure. Um, and then sort of what are the conditions uh, for having that infrastructure that we might let somebody else do and that we might trust, even if it's proprietary? And uh, in what ways do we need to make that extensible uh, to be able to make that fly? So just some questions for the community. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, CJ. Um